Hey everybody, John Fenn here, Church Without Walls International, C-W-O-W-I dot O-R-G. Hey, I want to give you a brief update before I get into the lesson today, talking about, actually about our free will and whose armor are we wearing after all. But first I want to update you um, uh, on uh, Chris, our handicapped son in the group home situation. The state of Oklahoma has adopted a new policy, some of which uh, I, I hope I had a part in that would allow visitation uh, 30 days from this week, basically. Uh, they'll start allowing visitation on site, which is good as far as it goes, but it's kind of like washing your feet with your socks on. Uh, because for our son, who's a mental four-year-old, just to have mom and dad visit him at the group home and then drive away is going to be torment. He, If he sees us come up the driveway, he thinks dad's coming to take me home. So my, I have submitted a, a proposal that they would allow a 14-day minimum visitation, which is the incubation time of the COVID virus. And after a minimum 14-day visitation, upon return to that group home, they would first be tested and then go back home, obviously, until the results are known. And if the results are negative, then they would be allowed back in that home uh, without fear of quarantine which uh, in the case of every nursing home in Oklahoma, every group home, every assisted living, every Alzheimer's unit, every veterans unit, uh, if it's a long-term care facility, any outside contact with the world results in 14 days being locked in your bedroom, 14 days straight, food, water, sleep, bathroom, everything, 14 days to make sure you don't have the COVID virus. So my proposal of having them home for minimum 14 days seems reasonable, and then they could be tested and be proven that they don't have the COVID virus. That would be great for those who have loved ones in nursing homes, group homes, and such. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, the other thing I want to mention real quickly is uh, that this Saturday, which uh, is the, what, 20... 20th, I believe. For those who would normally go to our EU conference that we would have held the end of May and 1st of June this year, if you had would normally have done that, you, we have folks in the EU, Israel, uh, Africa, uh, UK, etc., who would normally go to that. Uh, you probably received the email already, but we're doing a special Zoom conference. It's not for a worldwide meeting. It's just for those who have either registered or uh, have in the past uh, regularly come to the meeting. There's usually we have about 15 nations represented. So if you have not received that invite, uh, then contact uh, us uh, for that invite. And again, it's just specifically for those uh, that would normally come to our EU meeting or planning to come or had already registered, but somebody may have missed, been missed in the, in the mix there. But if you live in the EU, you're, you're welcome. Uh, and some of the others as well. And uh, we'll do another worldwide one here upcoming in the future. Uh, in fact, in July 9th, I think is our next one. But anyway, today talking about, you know, what, what <laughs> free will, how demons get into our lives, etc. First, let me say this, your will is sovereign. Neither God nor the devil can make up your will for you. They can try to influence you, but they can't make up your will. And it's a sad situation that many, many Christians resort to formulas and all kinds of stuff, including blaming the devil for what is really just the lack of their own free will. They don't have the fortitude, the backbone to stand up and exercise their will. And I think one of the reasons we're on enemy territory, the one of the reasons we do have a devil walking around is so that we can learn how to exercise the free will that the Lord gave us. Um, you know, how are you going to learn to exercise it unless it's tested? You know, a muscle doesn't grow unless there's resistance. And you have to understand that even when, when the devil was tempting Jesus, he was enticing him to change, you know, the stones to bread and, and jump off the high spot and to worship him. And those were enticements, but Jesus exercised his free will. A lot of people go back and say, well, he quoted the word to him. It's like, yeah, but beneath the word was the free will. And the point is you and I have free will so that we don't have to, to submit to, to the things of the devil. Every year, all around the world, millions of people of their own free will, get rid of habits and things that would kill them and things that are not good for them and change their lives just by exercising their free will. While so many Christians are saying, well, please pray for me. You know, the devil's after me and I need to do this and, and, and help me do this. It's like, oh, just stop being a baby and grow up and grow a backbone. Exercise your free will. Realize neither God nor the devil can, can have any power over you unless you give it to them. And secondly, you are in Christ. You've been given the responsibility, have been taught not to pray about demons, but to cast them out. Use the name of Jesus and tell them to get lost. And, and so let me talk about how that happens. How, how does a demon get into our lives? Well, you know, in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, uh, uh, Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various temptations, tests, and trials, knowing that the trials of your faith exercise work patience. 
But he goes on in verse 13 and he says, now let nobody say when he's tempted, tested, or tried that God is doing it to him because God does not test anyone with evil, tempted, test, or try anyone with evil. Neither is he himself tempted, tested, or tried with evil. And then verse 14, James 1, 14 says this, but everyone is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now the word lust there just means a desire that is, that is sinful, a desire out of control, a desire that would do sin. He says, everyone is drawn away of his own lust, that's within you, and enticed. The enticing is what the demon does. The demon is out there to entice the sinful desire that's already in your heart. You already know what your weaknesses are. For one, a weakness could be, you know, gambling away your life savings. And for another person, gambling isn't even a temptation. For another person, it could be maybe alcohol or something like that. But for another person, it's like they've never, alcohol's never been a temptation or test to them. So each person is different. Each body is different. We were raised in different ways. And, and so each one is different, but, but Satan knows, you know, the, uh, uh, the button to push to entice you. So the desire and the ability to sin is in the flesh, but the enticing is what the demon does. Now, Paul goes on to say in James 1 15, he says, now when, when the lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. So that is when the, de the desire, the ungodly desire and the enticing get together, sin is produced. And you know how that is. You can be resisting something. And I, I, I knew a guy um, early on, early on, uh, worked with this guy, and he was struggling with alcohol. And uh, every Friday night after work, he was used to going and, and uh, you know, having a party, getting drunk and everything else. But when he became a Christian, he, we, he and I were talking, and he, would, he, said, he talked about how he would, on Monday, he'd start thinking about Friday. You see, the desire was there in the flesh on Monday and Tuesday, and the enticing was going on, trying to get him to think about it and, and work towards that end on Friday where he could go and get, get plastered, you know, and become a danger to himself and his family and other people as well. And so God was helping to, to break him out of that. And I'll just add this. The way he did it was not just stop, but stop and replace. Uh, because the scriptural principle is not just to stop something, but to stop and replace it with something. In other words, uh, you give up one behavior, replace it with something else. In this guy's case, we found a Friday night uh, Bible study that he was interested in. And so he was able to replace the, the Friday night party with uh, a church uh, Bible study, and he really grew in the Lord. Uh, but the point is, there's that enticing, and when lust has conceived, when the enticing and the, and the lust get together, sin is conceived. There's that gestation period, just like a baby growing in the womb where it's, it's not seen, but it's growing on the inside of a person. And then Paul says, or James says in James 1, uh, 15, he says, now when that sin is finished, it will bring forth death. In other words, when sin has its final way, its, its mature, its completion, it will kill, it'll kill sometimes literally physically, other times it will kill relationships, it will kill marriages, it'll, care, it'll kill you know, uh, parent-child relations, it'll kill your job, whatever the case is. And so the, the idea is to get rid of the enticing to begin with, and you do that by rebuking the devil and telling him to get lost. Uh, and in fact, let me think for a minute about, remind you about this whole idea of, of taking authority over spirits, you know, uh, it's like, well, it's, you know, it's, it's in this region of town or it's over this town and I need to take authority over the spirits over the city. And, and there's a great fear out there in the body of Christ because they don't exercise their free will. They don't realize who they are in Christ. And, and I would, I would, I would remind you of this. When Paul went into Ephesus and so many people were born again, so many people renounced their occultism and their involvement in, in all that. They burned the books and their occult books and their formulas and sorceries and everything else. And it caused such an impact economically that there was a riot because the, the uh, idol makers were hurt financially because of a lack of business. And so I want you to think for a minute here that Paul, you don't see Paul going into Ephesus and saying, okay, we need to take authority over the spirits that rule this city. He didn't walk around town and say, okay, I'm going to take authority over this shop here and take authority over the spirits in that shop. No, no, no. He just presented Christ. And then when Christ comes into a person, then many times the demons will leave or that person will learn about their free will and who they are in Christ. And they will cut off the enticer while they deal with the, the flesh, because the fact of the matter is flesh loves to sin. And so the person, the Christian, has to deal with their desire and, and take control of it and discipline it and keep the, the enticer separated from the ability that we all have in the flesh to sin. So that separation helps. So, you know, it's like if you're, if you're going to sin, uh, you know, whether it be in front of a computer, driving by the 
uh, you know, the place of gambling, if that's the temptation or whatever the case is, uh, you know, change your behavior, get up from there, go do something else. And you can, you can certainly keep that enticer separated while you uh, deal with it in your own flesh. So, but what did Paul say in Ephesians uh, when he was writing to them? It wasn't a lot about the devil other than don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, you know, because if you hold on to that bitterness and that anger, it's, it's giving place to the devil. And right at the end, he talked about taking on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And that's what I want to close with is, is whose armor is that? If I say it's God's armor, it means it's possessive. It is the armor of God. It's like if I say it's John's shirt, then it, you understand it's the shirt that belongs to John. And so what was happening is when Paul's saying take on the armor of God, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, we have to say, okay, first recognize it's not our armor. It's not, it, it's the Lord's armor. And you may recall in First uh, Samuel chapter 17 and verse 39, when Goliath was tempting in, in Israel, and King Saul said, David, if you want to go and represent the nation, go ahead. And, and Saul put his own armor on David, his helmet and everything else. And David looked at it and said, I have not proven this in battle. I've not proven this armor in battle. And so the question is raised, you know, what David did do, what was proven in battle with the, his sling and his, his rocks that he picked up from the riverbed or wherever. And, and so we have to ask ourselves, when he says, put on the armor of God to stand against the wiles, the devices, the schemes of the devil, whose armor is it? It's God's. And it's been battle tested. Do you believe that? The answer is yes. We have scriptural proof. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 17, the Lord is kind of bemoaning the corruption that is in the nation. He talks about how somebody who wants to do right is made a victim, that truth fails. Nobody is looking to, for truth. No one's looking for God to find the absolute, how they should live. And, and so in verse, uh, 50, verse 17, 16, 17, he said, he saw that there was no man, that there was no intercessor. That therefore it says his arm brought salvation to him. Now remember the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. So it's literally his arm brought Jesus. And he goes on to say, and he put on the breastplate of righteousness. He put on the helmet of salvation. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. So you see when, when Paul is saying in Ephesians 6, wear the armor of God, He's talking about it's God's armor. And, and Isaiah 59 tells us it has been proven in battle. Jesus wore that armor, so to speak, as he was living and, and ministering. And so you don't have to be like a mime and say, okay, I'm going to put on my, my helmet of salvation now. I'm going to put on the breastplate of righteousness. No, you are in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. You are able to use the name of Jesus against the wiles of the devil. Don't turn it into a formula. Just recognize you already have the armor of God. And what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6 was intercessory prayer. And that's really what it is in Isaiah 59. It's all about intercessory prayer, praying for society, praying for, for righteousness and justice to be restored. And that's what Paul is in Ephesians 6. He says, praying for everyone, praying for all the saints. You know, Paul says, pray for me even, for boldness for me. So how do we do? put on the armor of God and stand against the wiles of the devil? Praise God, we have the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is the person of the word, not the written word, but first the person of the word, Jesus in our lives, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness. But we do that because Satan is the enticer. So you do that to exercise your free will. You're armed with the armor of God and exercise your free will and command that enticer to go, to leave in the name of Jesus. You have the authority to do so. And that's how it works. When, when a person fails a temptation, it is because they have let the enticer entice their flesh. They have conceived sin. They have went through the gestation period where sin became manifest. And if it continues repeatedly, it will kill you or it will kill your relationship, your marriage, uh, your job, whatever the case is. So the best thing is deal with the enticer right away. Just like Jesus did, he rebuked him and made him go to somewhere else. In other words, it, you know, Satan changed topics in trying to get Jesus until I think Luke uh, 4 says he, he left him for a season. You know, it's an exercise of free will, folks. Your free will is stronger than anything the devil can do. And if you stand in that test of wills, they will eventually give up and go somewhere else or come back at another time. Um, so anyway, there's a lot to it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your concern for our son, Chris, too, and the group home situation, keeping that in prayer. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.